Okay, we're going to cover something that needs to be covered because there's a lot of warnings in the Bible and evidently my ministry is about warning. If you notice my picture has gone off the bottom of the screen there and the reason for that is I'm tired of people looking at me and uh, thinking this is Mr. Christian giving them his understanding. I want you to focus on the Word of God on the screen and not look at my face. I want you to focus what the Bible has to say. I want you to focus on the Word that I'm giving. I am irrelevant. My face, my voice, who I am is irrelevant. It's the Word of God that's relevant. Everything the Word of God has to say is applied to believers. See, the one thing we fail to do is we fail to recognize that even though God loves us very much, we can still suffer His wrath. And it's a direct result of our actions. When you read the Word of God and only look at the parts where, that make you feel good and make you feel loved and blessed, but forget to look at the parts where He's warning you and telling you, you better turn from these things or you're going to struggle and suffer for it, we don't take the full counsel. Well, here on this channel, you're going to get the full counsel. We're going to cover everything. And since there's a bunch of people that seem to think that they can just believe whatever they want and not apply it uh, to the Word of God first to test it, and they won't listen to the hundreds of times I've said, test everything, and shared the same scripture that confirms it. We're going to dig into this a little bit, and we're going to help people understand just what can happen to the believer who decides he wants to walk in rebellion. But what is rebellion? Rebellion is denying the Word of God. Don't get the idea in your head that you have to deny the entire Word. Don't get the idea in your head you have to walk away from the entire Bible or God altogether. You can be a believer and still be in rebellion. That's who the sons of disobedience are. Unbelievers aren't sons. They're not sons of disobedience. Sons are sons. So when the Bible talks about sons of disobedience, he's talking about believers. This is very clearly evident in the Bible. We're going to cover two subjects in this video. And I don't know when this video will upload. I already told you guys, this is probably the last time I say it, that uh, I'm not going according to any prescribed uh, schedule anymore. I'm going to do videos as they're given to me, and I'm going to set them to upload as future times come. I've probably got four, three or four videos ready to upload uh, at different days. So whatever you're watching, I've probably pre-recorded it a few days in advance. My recommendation is, when you're listening to a video, that you take what's given in that video, take it to the Word, open your Bible, and prove it. Don't just listen to the person that's telling you these things. Prove it. Actually make some effort. You say you love God, well then why won't you prove His Word? Why won't you prove what people are telling you? Why do you just take what somebody says for granted? <coughs> that's not fair to you. That's not fair to Him. He says in his word, prove it. Test everything. Why won't you do that? This is the why we have so much deception. This is why we have so much separation. The true follower, the true born-again believer who is desperately trying to walk in truth, has no choice but to separate from the believers who refuse to take the full counsel and refuse to be accountable for their actions and decisions and instead make it that person's fault. The true believer, the one desperately trying to walk in truth, the one desperately trying to sound the alarm and give the warnings, bring the true understanding to light, has no choice but to isolate themselves because the people of God won't listen. Because the people of God won't respond. Excuse me, I'm diagnosing a vehicle for someone. So, what is the person who was called to sound the alarm supposed to do? People seem to think that this is really easy. Well, they're not the ones up here doing it. They're not the ones standing in the gap. Let's, let's be honest about what this is. Let's be honest about what the Word of God says about doing these things. It's not easy. It's 
It's not easy when you get stabbed in the face and in the back at the same time by people who tell you they love you. And even while they're cursing you, telling you they love you. That, I think that's amazing. My brethren, I love. Those that hurt me, I still love them. I don't have to agree with what they do, and I don't have to be nice about my response to it either. What I do have to do is be honest, truthful, and use the Word of God to apply it to everything. And that's what I'm going to do on this channel. There's no more time for the feel-good, warm and fuzzy, tingle message. If that's what you want, go to another channel. I'm going to be brutal, honest, and upfront. Because that's what God's doing to me. He's not going to sugarcoat his response to you. He's going to be just as brutal, honest, and upfront with you as I'm going to be, and anyone else is going to be. He'll do it more so. But what I will do is I will share his word and what his word says about these things and put it in a context that we can understand in this time frame and how it applies to us now. So don't get it twisted. You as a believer can come under the wrath of God. We're going to explore that in this video. What is the biblical understanding of the wrath of God? A lot of people don't understand what the wrath of God is. <coughs> Yet even though they read the Bible, it clearly says it. They still don't get it. Answer. Wrath is defined as the emotional response to perceived wrong and injustice, often translated as anger, indignation, vexation, or irritation. Both humans and God express wrath, but there is a vast difference between the wrath of God and the wrath of man. God's wrath is holy and always justified. Man's is never holy and rarely justified. We can, as, as humans, have moments of righteous indignation against evils done against God or his word. But we're only allowed so much. I, I very much hope people that are, have clicked on to watch this keep watching. If you really want the full counsel, you're going to get it as much as I can give it to you here. I really hope you listen because this applies to every one of us. In the Old Testament, the wrath of God is a divine response to human sin and, and disobedience. Idolatry was most often the occasion for divine wrath. Who, who does the idolatry? Who did the idolatry? That's in Psalm 78, 55, 66. Describes Israel's idolatry. The wrath of God is consistently directed towards those who do not follow his will. Let me highlight that. Who do not follow his will. How many times do you see God's wrath mentioned against unbelievers? in the Bible? And how many times do you see it mentioned against believers in the Bible? Against his own chosen people? I mean, at one point, God gave Israel a, a letter of divorcement, but then took them back. That was his wrath. So if you think that because you're a believer, God's wrath can't fall on you, you're wrong. Deuteronomy 1, 26-46, Joshua 7, 1, and Psalm 2, 1-6, through 6, the Old Testament prophets often wrote of the day in the future, the day of wrath, Zephaniah 1, 14, 15. God's wrath against sin and disobedience is perfectly justified because his plan for mankind is holy and perfect, just as God himself is holy and perfect. Did you know that every time you deny anything in the word of God, you sin against God? Did you realize that? Well, I don't really like that part, so I'm going to ignore that. Or, eh, I think I'm going to believe something a little different on that, because I don't like what, the way that makes me feel. Every time somebody changes what the Word of God means, when the Word of God says, torment and hell is eternal, and they change it to mean something else because they don't like that concept, you've sinned against God. You've denied His Word. Why would you do that? You wonder why you have problems in your life? You wonder why your prayers go unanswered? You wonder why you struggle? That's why. You're denying his word. You're walking in disobedience. God provided a way to gain divine favor, repentance, which turns God's wrath away from the sinner. Who repents? Who repents? 
What does the Bible talk about? What is the main concept of the Bible? Who is the main addressee in the Bible? The believer. Which turns God's wrath away from the sinner. To reject that perfect plan is to reject God's love, mercy, grace, and favor and incur his righteous wrath. <clears throat> the New Testament also supports the concept of God as a God of wrath who judges sin. The story of the rich man and Lazarus speaks of the judgment of God and serious consequences for the unrepentant sinner. That rich man was one of his chosen people, by the way. Luke 16, 19, 31, John 3, 36 says, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. I want you to notice what this says. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son, can you still believe and reject him? Absolutely. Christians are doing it right now as we speak. Notice he says, whoever does not believe. He says, whoever rejects. You can come into faith and then reject the Son. Will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. The one who believes in the Son will not suffer God's wrath for his sin, because the Son took God's wrath upon himself when he died in our place on the cross. Romans 5, 6-11. Now listen to what he says here because he kind of gets it a little bit wrong too. Those who do not believe in the Son, who do not receive him as Savior, will be judged on the day of wrath. Romans 2, 5-6. through six. This is true. But look at what he says up here. He never says whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. He never says whoever does not believe does not have eternal life. He says whoever rejects. You can believe and reject. We'll, we'll get there. Conversely, human wrath is warned against in Romans 12, 19, Ephesians 4, 26, and Colossians 3, 8 through 10. God alone is able to avenge because his vengeance is perfect and holy, whereas man's wrath is sinful, opening him up to demonic influence. For the Christian, anger and wrath are inconsistent with our new nature, which is the nature of Christ himself, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Now, he's a little off base here, too, because Christ got mad. To realize freedom from the domination of wrath, the believer needs the, for the Holy Spirit to sanctify and cleanse his heart of feelings of wrath and anger. Romans 8 shows victory over the sin of the life of the one who is living in the Spirit. Romans 8, 5, 8. Philippians 4, 4, 7 tells us that the mind controlled by the Spirit is filled with peace. And he's a little off base because the Bible also says that, that you can have a righteous indignation. You can have a righteous jealousy. You can have a righteous anger. The Bible says very specifically, be angry, but don't let the sun go down on your anger. Be angry and do not sin. Now, as a child of God, if I see somebody or hear somebody going against the word of God and clearly sinning against God, it's my responsibility to stand up for the truth as a child of God. I can have righteous indignation and anger towards that person for doing that. It's wrong. Towards the person directly? No. Towards what they're doing? Absolutely. If God hates sin, we're supposed to hate sin too. I can have that righteous anger against myself and my sin. The wrath of God is a fearsome and terrifying thing. Only those who have been covered by the blood of Christ shed for us on the cross can be assured that God's wrath will never fall on them. Or will it? Since we have now been justified by His blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? Romans 5, 9. So he's a little bit off base on some of these things because when you go back in the Bible and you look back through the Bible, how many times does he pour his wrath out on Israel? The Exodus was the very first time that I can remember. How many of those people did he kill because he was angry? Because he had wrath against them? They incurred his wrath? His chosen people? If it can happen to them, it most certainly can happen to us. Does God ever direct wrath towards believers? It's God's chastening born out of his love, not out of his wrath. Chastening is from love, like a father loves a son. Wrath, wrath is, from, is for disobedience. In July, August, Grace and Focus magazine article, I answered a long list of ten questions asked by a reader. In one of my answers, I suggest that repentance is not necessary to be born again, but 
it is necessary to escape temporal wrath in this life. A reader, and he's right and wrong on that, a reader sent me a nice letter. He said he agrees that repentance is not necessary to be born again, but he disagrees that it is necessary to escape temporal wrath in his life. In actuality, repentance is needed because the very first act that you perform when you get saved is an act of repentance because you turn from your life of unsaved to a life of saved. He writes, I show of no scripture, I know of no scripture, that mentions God's wrath towards a believer. God is a loving, forgiving Father who may find it expedient to chasten a believer caught up in sin, but chastening is born out of love, not out of wrath. Great point. Let's talk about it. First, in my magazine article, I did not specify that I was talking about believers. In my opinion, God does pour his temporal wrath on believers and unbelievers. However, I did not mean to, to differentiate in that article. Think of the book of Jonah, which the Lord cites in Matthew 12, 41. The Ninevites were marked for destruction, 40 days left. Then they would be wiped out. Every man would die, for sure, maybe everyone. But Jonah's message of judgment was met by repentance of every person and even all the animals. Jonah 3, 1 through 10. Because they repented, God relented and did not destroy all the Ninevites. Jonah 3, 10. Now surely, most if not all the Ninevites were unbelievers, but the point is their repentance extended their lives. <clears throat> the nations which Israel dispossessed were destroyed because their sins were filled up. If they had repented before it was too late, then they would not have been destroyed. Second, the word wrath is associated with God's temporal judgment all through the Bible, occurring 200 times. And that's all the scriptural references. I'll link this in the description if anyone happens to be interested to click on it. Now a number, well, actually we may go through these. He says a number of these refer to born-again people. So let's start at the end of the list and work our way up. Revelation 19.15 Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Well, who's on the earth at that time? There's believers and non-believers on the earth at that time. Let's go to Revelation 6, 16 through 17. And said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? I've pointed this out before. Those people, they know what's coming. If they're making this statement, and this is a quote, notice it has quotations, it's a quote of what these people are saying. They know what time it is. They know it's the wrath. How would they know? Could there be some believers in there? It's quite possible. Quite probable. 1 Thessalonians 1.10 and 5.9 And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. What's the other one? 5 9. Now, God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He tells us to edify each other and comfort each other for that. Here's the key verse For God did not appoint us to wrath. But could we fall under it inadvertently by our decisions? Could be. You can go through the rest of those. I'm going to try to keep this video as short as I can because long videos don't seem to be received very well. God's wrath fell on Israel on many occasions, and it fell on both believers and unbelievers alike. There is no hint that the believers were spared. The book of Jeremiah is a great example. Jeremiah was the only one that, that believed and trusted God. Being called a prophet of God, he suffered too. There is no hint that believers were spared. God's wrath fell on Israel in AD 70 when Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed and over one million Jews were killed. While most of those killed were unbelievers, surely some of those who died were believers. Remember the occasion even when Miriam and Aaron rebelled against their brother Moses? What happened? God's wrath fell on Miriam, clearly a believer, and she had leprosy for a week. 
Numbers 12, 1 through 16, verse 9 specifically says, So the anger of the Lord was aroused against them, Aaron and Miriam, and he departed. The very next verse tells us that Miriam became leprous as white as snow. She came down with leprosy because the Lord was angry with her. That's wrath. Aaron's two oldest sons, Nadab and Abihu, died because God's wrath fell on them as they offered up strange fire. Leviticus 10 and 1 through 11. It is highly likely that Nadab and Abihu were believers. Obviously they were if they offered strange fire up to the Lord. If their intent was to offer it to him, their, God's wrath came down upon them. Paul says that human government is appointed by God to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Romans 13.4 Clearly Paul is not restricting the wrath to unbelievers who break the law. Even believers who break the law will experience the wrath of God delivered via human government. You think you're exempt from God's wrath? The word of God says no. The coming seven year tribulation will be an outpouring of God's wrath on mankind. Mankind. There are people in this world right now on YouTube right now that are teaching people that they're going to go through the tribulation and not see wrath. This is in 1 Thessalonians 1, 10 and 5, 9, Revelation 6, 16, 17, and 19, 50. Believers and unbelievers will both suffer, though of course church-age believers will not because we will be raptured before the tribulation, as 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, and 5, 9 say. And I want you to notice something here. What have I told you before? And I shared the word of God to prove it. There are people who are claiming to be believers today, and some may actually believe, but have not fully converted, that will be left here. God, Christ is not going to take a cheating wife to heaven. He's not. You're either for him or against him. There is no middle ground. But this is what people seem to think, that they're going to hang on to the things of the world. But, but I love God. Do you? Why aren't you showing it? Why aren't you proving it? To him. You don't have to prove it to me or anyone else. Prove it to him. Believe his word. Go to his word for everything and not to man. You think you're exempt from wrath? Look, there's chastisement from a loving father. There's correction from a loving father. And then there's wrath from a vengeful father. Because a vengeful father, an angry father, can deliver wrath on a son that refuses to listen. When you turn and come back, then he'll receive you. But you've got to get back in that state of repentance. And no matter how many steps you take away from God, it's only one step to return. To think you're exempt from wrath just because you say you believe is the height of arrogance. If you're not obeying God, you're fully under wrath. It just may not have hit you yet. I just want you to remember these words. Christ is not taking a cheating bride to heaven. He's taking a faithful bride to heaven. While the word wrath is not used in Jude 21, it is implied to keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. The believer who avoids the immoral actions of false teachers will keep himself in God's love as he looks for the soon return of Christ and fullness of eternal life. But the believer who is duped by false teachers will experience God's wrath. Let's go look at Jude 21 real quick. I want you to notice something about this. This is what Jude says. This is one of Jesus' brother, brothers. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. So he had a different subject he was going to write, but the Holy Spirit changed it. It goes, no, no, write this. They need to listen. They need to learn something. They need to get a warning. Now, why does he do this? 
for certain men have crept in unnoticed who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. He's talking about believers. You can be a believer and be ungodly. How many of the Israelites are long dead and buried that were in this same exact state? Yet they were worshiping the one true God. Now Jude reminds them. <clears throat> I want to remind you, and you, you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. They witnessed God with their own eyes and still refused him. How can you know about God and then deny him? It happens. It's been happening since the very beginning. And the angels, standing in his presence continually, who did not keep their proper domain but left their own abode, he has reserved an everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. You don't think they, they believe? Absolutely they believe. They were there in the beginning of creation. Wrath is coming on them. As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. You do know where Sodom and Gomorrah is located, right? In Israel. They were not a they were not an excluded city. They were part of them. In fact, read through the Old Testament it, on two different occasions that I can recall, whole tribes were removed because they turned against him. You don't think you think you're exempt from God's wrath? Keep walking in, in disobedience and find out. Likewise also these dreamers defile the flesh. How do you defile your flesh? Running after sin and denying God's word? Believing in man and worshipping some, some man and what they have to say versus God's word? Rejecting authority? Speaking evil of dignitaries? How many of y'all keep talking smack about Trump? God put him in that office. But the word of God says so. You think you're not going to bring wrath down on yourself by being disobedient like that? Could happen. But these speak evil of whatever they do not know, whatever they know naturally, like brute, brute beasts and these things, they corrupt themselves. He's talking about believers. Woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. Cain offered a gift up to the Lord, so evidently he believed. What happened to him? The ground is still cursed where he killed him. Killed his brother. These are spots in your love feast, while they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves. They are clouds without water, carried about by the winds, laid on them trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots. Raging waves of the sea foaming up their own shame, wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Why would the Bible tell us, why would Jesus himself tell us many will enter into heaven with their head held in shame? These warnings are in the Bible for a reason. Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men, also saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment on all. To execute judgment on all. To convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. You can be a believer and still be a sinner. or all still sinners. But what is your desire? What are you striving for? Who are you putting your trust and faith in? These are grumblers, complainers, walking according to their own lust, and they mouth great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. That This is happening to me right now. People who are telling me they love me and, and uh, are just distraught because of what I'm saying. What am I saying? The Word of God? I'm reading you the Word of God. These, these are soothsayers. 
And they wonder why their lives are miserable. They wonder why they struggle. They wonder why they have issues. I wonder why. He goes on in verse 17 to say, But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. How they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts. These are sensual persons who cause divisions not having the Spirit. He's talking about believers. He's not talking about the unbeliever. The unbeliever doesn't enter into these things. They end up becoming unbelievers because they refuse God. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Are you drawing closer to Him or are you drawing closer to some man? Okay, then why are you watching their videos and taking what they say as gospel instead of taking the word of God as gospel? Why are you blaming those that are telling you the truth from the word, but you're blaming them for your conviction? It's the word of God giving you conviction. If you keep denying him, you're going to bring wrath on yourself. And on some have compassion, making a distinction, but others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. Don't like how I deliver my message? There's a reason why I do it. And this is just one pair of verses that talks about it. I've tried, even here just the last couple of days, have tried to change how I deliver my message. And every time I do, the Holy Spirit wrenches me back and sets me straight forward and says, do it this way. The harder I try to fight it, the harder he fights back. This is how I want you to deliver this message. Okay. I'm not going to deny him. I want to do this his way. You don't have to like it for it to be truth. You don't have to like it for it to matter. It's still the word of God regardless. While the word wrath is not used in Jude 21, it is implied. We covered that. Now we're going to go down here. But the believer who is duped by false teachers will experience God's wrath. 2 Peter 2, 18-22. Let's go there. 2 Peter 2. Eighteen, for when they speak great swelling words of emptiness, who? For in who speaks it? The unbeliever? They allure through the lust of the flesh, through lewdness, the ones who have actually escaped from those who live in error. They're going to bring unbelie or believers into their unbelief. Why are you watching somebody who's setting dates for the rapture? I'm not going to let this go. Why are you watching somebody who's setting dates for the rapture? When the word of God expressly says not to. When there's warnings right here in 2 Peter about doing this. While they promise liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by whom a person is overcome by him also he is brought into bondage. Christ set you free. Why are you walking back into prison? For if, after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the latter end is worse for them than the beginning. Jesus said, I would rather you stay unsaved than be lukewarm. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness. Listen, for it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. It would have been better if they had never gotten saved than to get saved and to deny him and deny his word. As a believer, you can bring wrath down on you by your actions and decisions. Repent. Because it has happened to them according to a true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit and a sow having washed to her wallowing in the mire. You think I like doing this? Let me pause for a minute. Do you all think I enjoy this? You think I like giving this message? It causes me pain. It causes me to shed my tears. 
I'm not I'm not playing on people's emotions here. I'm just being honest. I don't enjoy doing this, but I want to serve my God. And these warnings are here for a reason. And if we don't heed these warnings, we can fall into the same condemnation that's going to befall the unbeliever. Remember Revelation 6? Remember the last three verses? Why do they know it's the wrath of the Lamb? Unbelievers don't know that. Why do they know? Hmm. Maybe it's believers. Did you ever stop to think about that? Or you just turn your eyes and say, No, I'm not going to believe that. I can't believe God would do that. Really? What about all the times he's done it in the Bible? Why are you not reading the word? Why don't you believe his word and believe what he says? Why don't you turn to him and want to be with him and deny this world? Yes, God loves believers. Yes, he will for you, you we will forever be his, but that does not mean that we are immune to his wrath. I want you to marinate on that statement for a second. Read it again. Read it to yourself and think about it. Look, I'm here trying to help everyone. See, this is what he has shown me. So I would change and grow and, and run to him. And I've been directed to share it with you. And show you. Yes, God loves believers. Yes, we will forever be His. But that does not mean that we are immune from His wrath. You don't have to believe me, a non-professional. He's, he's, this guy's a professional. Believe him. Believe the Word. Finally, let me clarify regarding repentance and wrath. A believer who is in fellowship with God does not need to repent. Honestly, you end up walking in a state of repentance anyway. Constantly turning from the world to him. That's repentance. He simply needs to walk in the light of God's word, 1 John 1 7. And confess the sins which God brings to his attention. 1 John 1 9. And confess the sins which God brings to his attention. 1 John 1 9. Only believers who stray from the Lord in the spiritual far country need to repent. Luke 15, 11 through 32. No matter how many steps you take away, it's one step to get back. There's a lot of you that are doing this. Let's see. There's a lot of you that are doing this right here. When the prodigal son was unrepentant in the far country, he experienced famine, hunger, pain, loss of his money, and betrayal. No one gave him anything, though he had evidently been given lots of parties. Been giving lots of parties. Where'd he end up? Sleeping in the pig pen, in their feces and urine, eating out of their trough. That's where he ended up. Oh, but a loving God, he just can't do those things. Really, it happened to him. Why do you think that example is in the Bible? My letter writing friends, my letter writing friends says, and at no time did the father pursue the son and visit wrath upon him. The boy's own acts and decisions brought great discomfort and suffering upon him, but they were not the result of the father's visitation of wrath. Or were they? Everyone else had plenty to eat. Why didn't he? The text of Luke 15, 11-32 does not say whether the famine and want and pain were merely a natural result of the boy's foolish actions, or whether these things were also an outpouring of God's wrath upon the boy. In light of the Old Testament teaching on God's wrath, it seems more likely that the Lord intended his audience to understanding the suffering of the prodigal son to be a result of God's wrath upon him. See, it was only him that was suffering. No one else around him was suffering. And never responds or reports anyone else. Only, only him. Evidently, something very specific was going on. Maybe the father called ahead to some friends and said, Hey, he's coming. Here's where I want you to put him. That would be the father's wrath, wouldn't it? 
But look what happened when he came back. His wrath disappeared. I should mention that God rarely allows believers in fellowship with him to experience his wrath. Now, this is the love of God, is that he keeps us turned from that. But there are believers who will fight so hard to go with the world that they'll end up putting themselves in that situation. God cannot ignore sin. He cannot ignore disobedience. He cannot. He's a righteous God. The only time is when they are caught up in a corporate judgment. When God judged Israel, believers were impacted by the wrath. If God ever pours his wrath on the United States, or maybe I should say in the times when God has poured his wrath on the U.S., then believers will experience or have experienced that wrath too. Could that possibly apply to what's going on now or what's about to happen? You think things are going to get better after the election, after Trump has declared the winner? No. What have I been telling y'all? What have I been warning? This has been for several weeks now. Almost a month. Be ready. You're going to wake up one morning and your whole world's going to be changed. We're closer to that day than we've ever been. So close. You need to settle it in your hearts and be prepared. But what are people doing? They're running over and listening to fairy tales. I don't want to hear it. La, 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 la. It's still going to happen. If you make a wrong turn and shoot off of a cliff at 90 miles an hour and you're looking out the windshield and looking at the ground approaching you fast, closing your eyes, putting your fingers in your ear and saying, I don't believe it. It's not going to stop the inevitable. The car's still going to hit the bottom. You're still going to die. You're going to wake up with a steering wheel attached to your chest. That's the facts. Turning your head and ignoring it does not change it. Getting mad because you don't like what it says does not change it. It's still going to be the same thing. But aside from the corporate judgment, believers in fellowship with God escape his wrath. In fellowship with God is the key phrase. How are you in fellowship with God? First of all, reading his word, listening, in prayer, walking in his guidance and in his, in his instruction, not going over and listening to fairy tales. God told me, no he didn't, because what you're doing doesn't match his word. God will never command you to do something that goes outside of his word. Never. It's not going to happen. Yes, if we are in the spiritual far country, we can expect to experience his wrath. You put yourselves in the place of those that are about to receive God's wrath, and you will receive his wrath too. Now, if someone wants to call the calamities which prodigal believers experience the natural consequences of our sin and not God's wrath. I don't think this is a capital offense, but I think it is more accurate to say that God sovereignly sends calamities in the lives of prodigal believers to cause us to repent, and the Bible calls those calamities the wrath of God. Remember that the author of Hebrews warned born-again people, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord, and again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. We're going to end with Hebrews 10.31. Let's see. Now, in this group of scriptures, they're titled The Full Assurance of Faith. <clears throat> I want you to notice something here. This is talking to believers, completely talking to believers. Notice what he says in this context. Hebrews 10.26 For if we sin willfully after we received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. And I've covered this and I've explained this. I've put this in biblical context a couple of times. There no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation, which will devour the adversaries. If he's talking to believers, why do people ignore this warning? Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace? Non believers don't do that. 
believers do that. For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. The Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. I'm going to close with another scripture. The servant who knows his master's will. Luke 12, 47. Oh, no, that's not what I wanted to do. I've covered this one before. We're going to look at it again. This is what I'll end with. Luke 12, 47. This group of scriptures is titled, You Must Be Ready. Bless you. Thank you. Oh, sorry about that. Oh. We're going to start in Luke 12.35. I'm going to end with this group of scriptures because this very clearly paints the picture. Let your waist be girded and your lamps burning. Ephesians 6, you'll know what to gird your waist with. And you yourselves be like men who wait for their master. When he will return from the wedding, that when he comes and knocks, they may open to him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes, will find watching. Assuredly, I say to you that he will gird himself and have them sit down to eat and will come and serve them. Again, watching for a date on a calendar is not watching. Jesus is not a date on a calendar. And if he should come the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so, blessed are those servants. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Listen to what he's telling you here. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. We don't know what hour is going to happen. Therefore, you also be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. You can go and say what you want about the scriptures and what they mean. You can deny what they're telling you. There is no Christian that has ever walked this earth or currently walking this earth, that will be able to discover the date of the rapture. So if you're on someone's channel watching dates they're coming up with, you're just as wrong as they are because you're agreeing with them. You don't have to like it, but the word of God is clear. That's what I'm going to trust. Jesus himself, in his own words, so like I've said, when you're doing that stuff, you're denying the very word of Christ. In his own words, he says, I'm coming in an hour. You're not going to expect me. You're not going to know when I'm coming. Then Peter said to him, Lord, do you speak this parable only to us or to all people? Now he gets into some meat and potatoes. If that wasn't a good enough spiritual meal for you, listen to this. And the Lord said, Who then is the faithful and wise steward whom his master will make ruler over his household to give them their portion of food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. So, you know who he's talking about, right? You do know who he's referring to. Unbelievers are not servants of God. Believers are. He's talking to believers and believers only. Listen. Take this warning. Truly I say to you that he will make him ruler over all that he has. But if that servant says in his heart, My master is delaying his coming, and begins to beat the male and female servants, and to eat and drink and be drunk, the master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him, and then an hour when he is not aware, and he will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. This is a warning to believers. He differentiates that this servant is a believer because he's going to appoint his portion with the opposite, the unbelievers. You can be a believer and you can wind up in the tribulation. You can be a believer and wind up suffering the wrath of God. Why do you think the great multitude is so big? It's made up of believers who needed to repent. Believers who were denying his word. Believers who were looking for something that isn't true. 
instead of looking for the truth. If this is you, you need to get into prayer. And you need to go to Him. I believe the Word of God. Why don't you believe it? It's right here on the screen in front of you. I took my face off the screen. You can't look at me now. You have to look at the Word. You have to face the truth. If you continue to deny it, you will be this person. Verse 47, And that servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself, did not prepare himself, or do according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. Is there any other interpretation to this other than you're going to receive punishment? Any other. And the servant and the believer who knew Christ's will and did not prepare himself or do according to Christ's will shall be beaten with many stripes. Verse 48, But he who did not know, yet committed things deserving of stripes, shall be beaten with few. He didn't know. For everyone to whom much is given, from him much will be required, and to whom much has been committed, of him they will ask the more. Any questions? There should be none. This is clear. This is straightforward and to the point. So now, if you're going over listening to fairy tales and listening to people who are, and, and you're aligning with them and agreeing with them and telling them, praise the Lord and God bless, you're joining up with their sin. If you're doing that and doing things that go directly against the very words of Jesus Christ himself, you are these people. You wonder why you suffer and you wonder why you, you struggle and your prayers go unanswered. The Word of God tells us everything we need to know. Luke 12, 49, I came to send fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. Jesus was already mad. He goes, I want to separate you all. You need to learn. You guys need to wake up. But I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how distressed I am till it is accomplished. Jesus knows how we feel, and he because he felt it. It's right there. Do you suppose I came to give peace on earth? I tell you, not at all, but rather division. For from now on, five in one house will be divided, three against two and two against three. Father will be divided against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. told you before, I'm seeing this happen in my own life. Now look at what he says down here. It's still Jesus talking. Luke 12, 54, Then he also said to the multitudes, Whenever you see a cloud rising out of the west, immediately you say a shower is coming, and so it is. And when you see the south wind blow, you say there will be a hot weather, and there is. Hypocrites! You can discern the face of the sky of the earth, but how it is you do not discern this time? Is anyone confused at this point? You shouldn't be. Jesus is very clear about what he's saying here. There's no misunderstanding. Why would you receive these warnings? They're here for a reason. I believe what he says. I fear him because of what he says. And I trust this. I'm going to keep trusting it. See, people nowadays don't give these warnings. They don't share this part of the word because they don't want to offend anybody. They want to be patted on the back and they want to hear them amens and God bless you's and praise the Lord's in their comment sections. I'm not here for that. I'm here to give the truth and this is the truth. 
God's looking for people to proclaim His truth in His Word. And there are very, very few people willing to do it. Mainly because it's hard to do. So, y'all need to start reading this Bible. And you need to start paying attention to what's being presented. And you need to take everything given to you and test it against the Word. Everything. There, take nothing for granted. Don't take anything I tell you as truth. Go prove it with the Bible. I help you by getting you 99% there by putting it on the screen. It doesn't get any easier than this. You've got a decision to make. I highly suggest you make it quick. Because you may not have tomorrow to make it.